as we work through this gospel. I realize that I'm only up to Mark 9, and I have, this is sermon number 33, um, as we have been going through the gospel of Mark, and so and we still have a fair way to go. Um, hopefully it's, as we get to, as we come to go through it, it'll be a blessing to everyone. Mark chapter 9, we'll be reading from verses 2 to verse 8 this morning, which will also be our text. Mark 9, starting at verse 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Our song of preparation is number 373, Beautiful Savior, King of Creation, Son of God and Son of Man. We rise to sing the four stanzas of number 373. Once again, congregation, if you're able to, please keep your Bibles open to Mark chapter 9 as we look at this, this wonderful, glorious passage this morning. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, many, many years ago, I worked for a boss back in Ontario who I, if you can love and admire a boss to the extent that I did, I did. Um, I had a great amount of respect for him, felt almost a father-son relationship between us. And so when I became a Christian, after a few years of our relationship, I wanted him to know, too, about Jesus. And I remember talking to him many times about it and trying to uh, tell him about the Bible, what I had read, what I had been learning. And at one point, he came to the point where I think he was just a little bit fed up, and he said, Mitch, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something. And uh, with that, he kind of was dismissing any more further conversations um, that I had with him. And you get that kind of an, a, a, an attitude from many people in the world. Many people would say, 
doesn't really matter what you believe. Whatever religion you practice, how, whatever path you want to follow, whatever you want to choose, that's up to you and it's all good, it's all fine. We, on the other hand, as Christians, say Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only way to the Father. Why do we say that? Why should we believe in Jesus as the only Savior? And why should, should we exalt Him and uphold Him as the only path of salvation? Why is His salvation, the salvation that He provides, superior to every other claim of every other savior, every other prophet, of every other religion. We see it this morning in our passage. Because of who Jesus is. Jesus is and was divine. He was God in the flesh. Jesus was not merely a better man than all other men. He was not merely a wise teacher or philosopher. He was not just one more way to God. He was very God of very God. And we see this in our passage as the disciples, Peter, James, and John, are given a glimpse of the glory of Jesus on the mountain. His birth had been supernatural. He had taught with divine authority in their hearing. He had commanded the very wind and waves in the boat with them. He had healed the sick and raised the dead with a mere word or a mere touch. But now he adds the supreme evidence of his origin and of his mission. His glory, which was thinly veiled in his human flesh, was allowed for a brief moment to shine forth. His divinity, we might say, broke through the limitations of his humanity. The apostle Peter writes, and Peter, of course, as we see, was one of the eyewitnesses to this. And later on in his letter in 2 Peter 1.16, he writes that they were eyewitnesses of His majesty and that God the Father honored and glorified Jesus on that mountain right before their eyes. And congregation, we have to remember that the disciples needed this. Perhaps more than any other Christians in any other time through all of history, remember that after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the disciples would begin to preach the good news of salvation found only in His name. And their teaching would go against the grain of Judaism. What they proclaimed would contradict every religious leader in Israel at that time and all of the pagan religions around them, especially the Greek religion, which saturated the cities of that time. And the disciples would face great tr and tremendous persecution as a result of their teaching. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 22, Jesus tells them that they would be delivered up to tribulation, they would be killed, they would be hated by all nations for His name's sake. And so they needed to be convinced, like no one else, they must know that the Savior they were going to proclaim was no mere man, that He was the true and living God in the flesh, that He was the God of their fathers, that the one with whom they walked and talked was the God of Moses and Elijah. And so Jesus is transfigured before their very eyes. And congregation, what they beheld with their own eyes has been recorded for us in Holy Scripture so that we may know that we have a Savior who is superior to every other Savior, so that we may know that no matter how great our sins are, Jesus is greater, so that we may know that even though the world may mock the church for believing in some man who died on a cross, Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords in the flesh. Our theme this morning as we look at Mark 9, verses 2 to 8 is this. Jesus reveals His divine glory at His transfiguration. Jesus reveals His divine glory at His transfiguration. We'll see in the first place His appearance changed. In the second place, His Old Testament witnesses. And in the third place, the testimony of His Father. But as Jesus reveals His divine glory at His transfiguration, we see in the first place that He does so by changing His appearance. In verses 2 and 3 we read, Now after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and He was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Mark records that this incident took place 
after six days. After what six days is he talking? That is six days, and if you remember way back, uh, we looked at the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples back in chapter 8. And this conversation, we said, took place at a place called Caesarea Philippi. And in chapter 8, you might recall, we read of Jesus asking the disciples this vital question, who do you say that I am? And Peter, remember, answered well. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. What was he saying? He was confessing that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, that he was the one who God had promised in the Old Testament, the one who had come to redeem Israel, that he was God's anointed servant. But je then Jesus begins to explain to them what being the Christ really meant, that the Christ must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And Peter, we remember, took issue with that. We read that in Mark that he took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke him. He says, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus in turn rebukes Peter very strongly. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God but the things of men. And then Jesus begins to teach his disciples that in fact not only must he suffer, but they also will suffer and must suffer. And he warns them that whoever was ashamed of him and his words in this generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And then he rounds off that discussion with these words from chapter 9 verse 1. Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. What was he saying? He was saying that there were some among the disciples who would behold with their own eyes a glimpse of the, of the glory of God's kingdom to come in their lifetime. And this was the answer to that. This was the fulfillment of that. Now Peter, James, and John receive that glimpse. Jesus takes them up onto a high mountain where God often communicates with his people. If you read through the Bible, quite often you hear that mountain theme coming up again and again. And he takes them by themselves. That is, only they were allowed to see this. This was an amazing privilege and honor that he gave to them. Peter, James, and John in other places, are you see them as the inner circle those closest to Jesus. And so he takes them by themselves up on the mountain. And Mark and Luke and Matthew and John, they all record that Jesus was then transfigured before their eyes. Now, the Greek word translated transfigured is a word that has made its way into our lang uh, English language. The Greek word sounds like this. It's translated transfigured. Metamorpho. Metamorpho. From which we derive the English word, of course, metamorphosis. Now, children learn in school that metamorphosis is when something changes its form to become something else. And so metamorphosis happens, say, when a maggot becomes a housefly, or a tadpole becomes a frog, or a caterpillar became a butterfly, becomes a butterfly. Maybe for some of the younger children here, I'm just blowing your mind, but yes, that's what happens. That's metamorphosis, when one, something changes its form to become something else. Uh, perhaps a greater uh, form of its form. And here Jesus is transformed, he is changed before the eyes of his disciples for a brief moment. We might say that the curtain, as it were, was pulled back to reveal who Jesus really was. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that before his incarnation, Jesus was in the form of God. That is, that he possessed all the characteristics of the divine nature. All that God is, Jesus was and is. All glory, power, majesty belonged to Jesus and still does. But to be our Savior, Paul tells us in Philippians 2, Jesus had to take on the form of a bondservant and come in the likeness of men. And his incarnation involved a great process of humbling and condescension on his part. But now he allows Peter, James, and John to see 
for a brief moment his heavenly glory, to see who he really was. And Mark tells us that his clothes become, became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as a laun uh, no launderer on earth can whiten them. And this is taken from the world of, uh, this is language taken from the world of wool manufacturing. And in that time, when a sheep is sheared, the wool, lies still today, wool has to be washed. And in Roman times, what was used to wash that wool was uh, stale urine. And they would have it in big buckets, um, uh, and uh, they, would have, uh, they would pour this urine into there, put the wool down in there, and the slaves would stomp on this um, wool until it beca became white. And the, the wool, as a result, would, would become dazzlingly white, would become uh, dazzlingly clean. And so uh, this language is, uh, is adapted from that, that world of wool manufacturing. But now, before their very eyes, Jesus himself becomes radiant, more dazzling than any wool that they had ever seen whiten. And the gospel writer Matthew says that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And Luke says that his, uh, the gospel writer Luke says that his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And we have to understand that in their own way, the inspired authors were just trying to describe something that really cannot be fully described. Something greater than human words can really express because Peter, James, and John were beholding the glory of the true and living God. Now, God's appearance in the Old Testament is often associated with brilliant light. In Exodus 24, for instance, which is an Old Testament foreshadow of our present passage, Exodus 24, we read in verse 17 of Exodus 24 that the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. In Exodus 34, verse 29, we read that when Moses came down the mountain, that the skin of his face shone because he had been in the presence of God. And now we read of Jesus exhibiting divine brilliance. His appearance changed. And his divine glory shone through, more dazzling than human words can describe, as radiant as the sun itself. And through this change in his appearance, Jesus was revealing that he was the God of the Old Testament, the God who had revealed himself to their fathers, the God who had promised to save and restore them. And that's why, congregation, we may believe that there is no one else who can save us like Jesus. There is no sin that Jesus cannot forgive, nor has he uh, forgiven. That is the confession of those who believe in him. His salvation is perfect because the one who came to die for our sins is God himself. The one who was judged for our sins is the judge himself. The one who took away God's anger is the only one who was equipped to take away such anger because he himself was God in the flesh. And so, beloved of God, whatever your burdens may be this morning, cast it upon Jesus. However great may be your sins, hand them over to Jesus. Whatever comfort you may seek, find it only in Jesus. He alone is our Emmanuel, our God with us. He alone is the eternal, almighty God. But as Jesus reveals his divine glory at his transfiguration, we see in the second place that he does so with Old Testament witnesses. In verses 4 to 6, we read that uh, Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And so, as if it were not enough that the appearance of Jesus became dazzlingly bright, the disciples now witnessed the appearance of two powerful Old Testament characters, Elijah and Moses. Now, there's, there's some questions that we have to answer here, obviously, like why them and not anyone else? What is the significance of their meeting with Jesus and how did the disciples even recognize that this was Elijah and Moses? But before we get into that, I want to touch just briefly on the fact 
that this was Moses and Elijah that appeared here meeting and talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah, of course, had lived many, many years, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And yet here they were talking with Jesus. How the disciples recognized them, we're not really told. We can only chalk this up to divine revelation. God gave them the ability to recognize who Jesus was talking to. But more importantly is that they were talking to Jesus. And this is just one more piece of biblical evidence that the God that we worship is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. This is yet another word of encouragement to those who grieve, to those who have said goodbye to loved ones who have passed from this life. The death for those who die in Christ is not the end. We simply go from this realm to life before the presence of our Heavenly Father. But back to the question, why Moses and Elijah? Well, the simplest and shortest answer to that question is that Moses was the greatest leader of Israel and Elijah was the greatest prophet in Israel. Moses, of course, was the human instrument in God's hands when he led the Israelites out of Egypt at the Exodus. And by the way, there's a lot of Exodus imagery here. It was to Moses that God gave his law, which he in turn delivered to Israel. And so Moses, we might say, was the great lawmaker, the lawgiver. And God used Elijah. Remember 2 Kings 19, or 1 Kings 19. God used Elijah to bring reformation to his people when they were saturated with Baal worship. Remember the whole Mount Carmel incident? It was Elijah who called Israel to stop. He said, stop faltering between two opinions. If Yahweh is God, serve him. If Baal is God, then go and serve him. But stop standing in the middle, undecided. And so Moses and Elijah represented two very powerful figures in the history of Israel. No wonder we read this prophecy in the book of Malachi, which um, most likely is, is being fulfilled in, um, in, in Mark 9. In Malachi 4, we hear this prophecy in uh, verses 4 to 6. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And so here again, in this Old Testament prophecy, this final Old Testament prophecy in the book of Malachi, we have Moses and Elijah being mentioned according to their most important roles. Moses is, is mentioned as the lawgiver, and Elijah is mentioned as prophet, the prophet of prophets, we might say, who through his work would reform Israel, turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of Israel back to their God. And so two greater Old Testament figures cannot be imagined, the lawgiver and the reformer. But why were they speaking with Jesus? Again, simple answer, and we, then we open it up, to witness that all the work that they had done would now come to an end and be fulfilled in his work. All the law and the prophets find their meaning in Jesus. As Paul would later write in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 2, all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen in him to the glory of God through us. All of God's preparations, all his prophecies, his preservation of the covenant line found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so the greatest leader of Israel, accompanied by the greatest prophet in Israel, appear now to witness that their time was now over. The time of Jesus was here. He was about to fulfill all that they had merely foreshadowed and prepared for. And the gospel writer, Luke, fills in the blanks for us as to what they were actually talking about. In our NKJVs, um, in Luke 9.31, it says that they spoke to Jesus of his decease, that is his death. But interestingly, the Greek word that Luke uses there in Luke 9.31 is the word exodon, from the, word, from the Greek word exodus. And so literally, they spoke to Jesus concerning his exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, as, just as Moses had led Israel out of Egypt from slavery, and Elijah had led um, Israel out of their slavery to Baal worship, so Jesus was now about to lead his people out of the greater slavery, the, the slavery of sin and death. And he would do so by surrendering himself to the rejection of his people, to intense suffering, and to a cruel death on the cross. Peter, of course, as we see, did not fully understand what was going on here, and so he asked permission of Jesus to make three tabernacles or tents or booths to accommodate these three great men gathered in one place. He was simply reacting out of the great fear that they all felt as they saw this awesome sight. We might say that Peter was stupefied here. He was just babbling the first thing he could think of. In his mind, this was a wonderful moment that must be commemorated. But he, what he didn't understand that he, it was that he was trying to prolong something that could not and cannot be prolonged. Moses and Elijah were merely Old Testament witnesses that the law and the prophets had now come to an end in Christ. That's why, remind, let's remember again, we, we don't read the law every Sunday as a means to gain or keep our salvation. Neither do we look for further prophecies because Jesus has fulfilled the law and the prophets. And so, beloved, don't trust in your good works, nor wait for fuller revelation. All that we need is found in Jesus. And, and this grows in us more and more. The longer we, are and the, uh, the, we live and the longer we are Christians, it takes us some time to grasp that. But once we grasp it and we get that, and it's not me, it's not my law-keeping, it's not my good works, it's all of Jesus. It's the most wonderful thing. That's why we sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I remember years ago, after I was baptized and made profession of faith for the first time, having not been a Christian, come into the church, um, it took me a while, it took me a, a, quite some time to, to understand that. It was all about Jesus, not about me. In a couple of weeks after my profession of faith and baptism, my pastor, who was a very wise man, he took me out one day and he said, Mitch, how's it going? This was a couple of weeks after my baptism and my profession of faith. And I'll never forget the words I said to him. I said, Pastor, I don't think the baptism took because I still feel so sinful. And you know, all of us are tempted to, to look at ourselves that way and to look at what we have done. What are we doing? And what we're really doing is taking our eyes off of Christ. Um, and, but we have to remember, it's never about us. Never about us. It's always Christ. He is our righteousness. His divine holiness is ours when we believe in Him. And so the law and the prophets fulfilled in Him. Now we are called believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us make every effort to believe in Him this morning. Once again, not leave this place without believing in Jesus and, and, and uh, possessing that great comfort that is ours through Him. But as Jesus reveals His divine glory at His transfiguration, we see in the third place that further evidence is given by the testimony of His Father or his, the witness of His Father. In verses 7 and 8 we read, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now, Peter does not receive an answer from Jesus as to his request to build three tents. What happened next was that they were given testimony from God the Father that they could see and that they could hear. A cloud, we read, came and overshadowed Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, so that Peter and James and John could not see them anymore. And then they heard a voice saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Well, what does all this mean? Well, the cloud was further evidence that they were in the presence of a divine manifestation. What they were experiencing was a divine experience. In the Old Testament, we read of many instances when the Lord's presence would be signified by the presence of a cloud. So a couple of examples. Exodus 24, verse 15 to 16. 
Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. That's Exodus 24, 15 to 16. And then Exodus 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And then now finally, Numbers 12, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called to Aaron, uh, Aaron and Miriam. We might also think of the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8, where we read um, of uh, King, Solomon, um, King Solomon's temple that he had built for the worship of the Lord being covered with a cloud. We read in 1 Kings 8 that when the priest came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so at many times, in many places in the Old Testament, the presence of God is represented by the presence of a cloud. And now we read of a cloud overshadowing or enveloping Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. What was happening here? God was making his presence known. And then he speaks out of the cloud, declaring Jesus to be his beloved son and commanding his disciples to listen to what Jesus taught them. Now, we have to understand that there is a number of Old Testament passages that are being fulfilled in just these few words of the Lord. Genesis 22, for instance, where God refers to Isaac as the beloved son of Abraham. He says, take your son, your only son, the one you love. And so this, uh, he's, he's drawing on that language from Genesis 22. He's drawing from Psalm 2 where, where he declares of Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And also from Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 where Moses says to Israel, the, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And so the words of God the Father at the transfiguration here are to be understood as his affirmation of the unique sonship of Jesus and the divine authority of his words. The disciples are called to hear him, to listen to him, not to doubt him, because he was speaking in the authority of his Father and he was speaking with divine truth. Peter would later write in his second letter that when they heard the voice from heaven... It was a confirmation of all the words that the prophets had spoken in the Old Testament. And congregation, it is absolutely vital that we heed these words as well. God has declared that Jesus is his beloved son and we are to listen to him. And what has Jesus said? He said many things, but here, here are a few examples of some of the things that Jesus said. He has declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. He has said that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He has said that whoever believes in him has eternal life. You are in possession of eternal life if you believe in him. He calls all who are weary and burdened to find rest in him and him alone. And he said that he will come again in glory as judge. And there are many other things that he has said. And we are to believe the words of Jesus and not doubt. The end of this event is itself a testimony to the truth of all this. In verse 8, we read, Suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. And so the cloud disappears. And Elijah and Moses, the greatest figures of the Old Testament, have vanished. Of course they have. Their work is done. They have no permanent standing. And Jesus alone remains to complete his journey to Jerusalem, to do the work for which he was sent, a work that he and he alone can and must do. And we are left to simply marvel. And may we marvel this morning once again and continue to marvel every day of our lives. Because you see, the devil and our sinful nature want us to go back to, what can I do to be saved? What can I do to be saved? But that's not what God wants us to see in the Bible. He wants us to see not what we do, but what he has done. 
He wants us to see that He, the God of glory, came to us in Jesus to save us from our sins. He did what no other could do because only one divine could bear divine wrath. And so, beloved, leave this house again this morning stunned at God's incomparable love, His mercy and His grace, and yet confident that there is no Savior like Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the inscripturated Word, the Bible, in which we hear many amazing things. But more amazing than it all is that the Son of God, the second person of the divine trinity, who himself is eternal God, came in the flesh to save us. And we thank you that recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures is a moment when he gave a glimpse to his disciples on the mountain as to who he really was. And we thank you that you confirmed who he was and his work by the appearance of Moses and Elijah and by the cloud that represented your presence and the voice that commanded the disciples and us to believe that Jesus is your beloved Son and we are to listen to him, we are to hear him. Open our hearts, open our ears this morning that we would indeed hear. Help us not to doubt but only to believe and to marvel and to be stunned by the greatness of Jesus and the perfection of his salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. Number 372 is our song of response. At